Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Alcoholic, very, very grateful to be here, very excited to do 10 and 11. I actually asked Marty if I could do it. I've been taking a break from Zoom and uh, just a much needed break. You know, everybody needs a little time down. And and I saw that he didn't have anybody doing 10, 11, and 12. And I said, Marty, would, I, would you mind if I did that? And he said, Kate, I'd, I'd be honored. And I, I am always honored. I love talking about the steps. Why? A lot of reasons. One is I misunderstood them terribly bad. So if I leave out saying, if, I, if it sounds like I'm saying and talking to you, I'm not. It, this is all from my own experience. There is, I've, I've been sober since October the 28th of 1984. That makes me 36 years sober. I turned 63 on Monday, and uh, I, came, I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years old, very, very broken, chasing a boy into the rooms of AA, had a five-year-old little girl. I clearly drugged that little girl in places she had no business being. I can tell you I know pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. I was raised on values, and I was breaking every value I had. And so the easiest way for me to explain to you that I'm an alcoholic is when I start, I can't stop, and I can't stop starting. I don't want to waste any more time on that. You know, there's a time that I'm going to sit with the new guy, knee to knee, and, you know, get, make him understand the allergy and the mental obsession and all that. But right now, we're talking about 10, 11, and 12. That's way farther down the road. I think most people are ready to jump into this. I misunderstood so much. So I offer you uh, a consideration. Come to our meeting on Wednesday night. We, we had such a great response to our Tuesday night Zoom meeting that when we started meeting in person, we were no longer going to have the Zoom meeting on Tuesday night. Our group conscience elected to do it on Zoom indefinitely. Not you now COVID's over. We're still doing it. And it, it's a really unique way to learn the big book. Uh, we, we, the, one of the things that we do that's a little different is that we, we ask that you not share your experience. Now, don't get me wrong. Your experience is wonderful. If that, if that just bugged you right there, please hear me out. What we want to hear is what the founders found necessary, why they put it in the big book, why they put it in there, and what's the point they're trying to get across. We're trying to study the text for the purpose of the text. Your own experience is very valuable, but just not at this particular meeting. So if you, if you pin my picture, besides I think I'm looking pretty cute, uh, if you pin my picture, you'll see at the bottom the uh, Zoom number. We don't have a password. It's on Wednesday nights at 7.30 Central Standard Time. We'd love to have you come. We're in, there is a solution right now. It'll probably take us two years to get through the book. And if you really want to learn the book, well, then God darn it, make a commitment and come to that meeting and, and do it. Don't, don't let anything come between you and that on a Wednesday night at 7.30 Central Standard Time. Uh, my husband, usually Charlie, most of you guys know my husband, Charlie Parker, love of my life. He always likes to say I'm a little bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose. I'm a lot coming at you. And that is not false. I am a lot coming at you. I'm deeply passionate about the big book. I'm deeply passionate about recovery. And I always like to say, you know, I am the vessel to help you get connected to the power. I am not the power. I don't ever want to be the power. I don't ever want to manage your life. That is not my job. My job is to get you connected to the power so the power can tell you what to do. Trust me, I have done sponsorship where I was like your life coach. And, and I gave some good information. But the truth of the matter is, I have no idea if that was what God's plan was. There are some other little things I like to throw in, and, and that is that the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was named by the Library of Congress as one of the 88 books that shaped America. I mean, if that doesn't give you goosebumps, that our big book was one of, is named by the Library of Congress as one of the 88 books that shaped America. Man, unbelievable. And you know the history of writing the big book. My God, get involved with what's going on with the big book right now. Find out through your, G, your, your, your districts and your GSRs and all of that. We're looking at doing some changes, you know, and, and I'm not saying they're good, bad, right, wrong, but by golly, no, no, cast your vote, have your voice be heard. That's what Bill wanted this to be about. I mentioned that in front of a group of about 2,500. And I said, you know, my book sat on the shelf for 15 years. There was a collective groan. It really caught me off guard. And I went, 
Oh, right. Like your book hadn't sat on the shelf. Come on. You know, I love it when people are like, I've been nailing it from day one. I'm like, well, let's talk to your family. Let's see how well you're nailing it. It's the nature of life is an ebb and flow. Pain is the touchstone of growth. None of us are nailing this thing perfect. As a matter of fact, why would we need God if we had no problems? We turn to the creator through our heartache. That's what this is about. I like to consider myself a big book teacher at this point, right? And when I need to be the student, trust me, I am the student. Today, I get to be the teacher. I love that. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot on 10 and 11, very little on 12. I think 12 is just a very broad topic. Uh, but um, one of the things about the 10th step is, is, is I thought the 10th step was the evening review. So if you're sitting here going, well, it is the evening review. I get it. I thought it was the evening review. Come to find out the 10th step is a spot check inventory. The evening review is actually the 11th step. I, I have some theories on why we misunderstood this particular step. Why in an AA meeting, when somebody says I'm doing the 10th step evening review, I think the 12 and 12 muddied the waters a little bit. I think oral AA has caused us to misinterpret the 10th step, but I misinterpreted it so bad. Now, don't don't get me wrong. I wasn't doing it anyway. But now that I know it is a spot check inventory, and now that I'm at a different place in my recovery, I really understand the 10th step. Mark Houston was the one who woke me up behind this step. He woke me up in a way, and it wasn't the minute I met him. It wasn't the, the first four years that I'd known him. He woke me up about six years ago on a CD that he had that just blew my socks off. And I studied the heck out of that thing. And Mark always said, when you're studying, you're, stu you're not studying for knowledge, you're studying for experience. So he would say, if you're reading a spiritual piece of literature, read a paragraph and then go back through and ask yourself what each question means to you. It, spiritual literature was never designed to be read. It was designed to be studied. That's, that's, that's some stuff I, I just went right over my head. Now, don't get me wrong. Now that you're learning that the 10 step is a spot check inventory, you don't want to go to your next you know, open discussion meeting when they say, let's talk about the 10 step evening review and go, hey, flag on the field, right? You know, you're not doing it right anyway, because the book tells me I must grow in understanding and effectiveness. And if I'm to grow in understanding and effectiveness, I should wait for a couple of shares to go by. And then I like to say something like this. You know, guys, I swear this meeting's on the 10th step. And I used to think it was the evening review. Come to find out right here in the big book. It's at the 11th step. And, and, and if it's at the 11th step, what's the difference between what I thought it was and what it really is? That way, I am bringing some depth into that meeting. I'm not in there to say, well, my big book says that that shuts an alcoholic down so fast. We must grow in understanding and effectiveness. I came out of untreated alcoholism at 17 years sober. I was going to five meetings a week. I had no idea I wasn't working the AA program. I was sponsoring seven people. I was making five meetings a week, but I was not working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, I was taking them off the wall. But then, you know, I heard somebody say, if you take them off the wall, you get an off the wall program. Absolutely. Well, here's something that I think sums up what the 10th step is talking about. And I, I got this up. I like, I, I, I lean towards Christianity. That's just my choice. You can do, lean towards Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, whatever your choice be. But that's the spiritual teachers that talk to me is more of a Christianity. And so I got this out of Jesus Calling, and I really like it. It says, problems are a part of life. They are inescapable, woven into the fabric of our world. We tend to go into problem-solving mode all too readily. We take action as if we have the capacity to fix everything. This is a habitual response, so automatic that it bypasses the conscious thinking. Not only does the habit frustrate us, it also distances us from God. Do not let fixing things be your top priority. We're ever so limited in our capacity to correct all that is wrong in the world around us. Don't weigh ourselves down with responsibilities that are not our own. Instead, make our relationship with God our primary concern. Talk with God about whatever is on our mind seeking his perspective on the situation rather than trying to fix everything that comes to our attention. Ask God to show us what is truly important and remember that we are en route to freedom and let our problems fade into the sunlight of the spirit and the universe. 
And to me, that sums up 10 and 11. 10 and 11 just go together like a hand in glove. They are, they are so uh, interwoven. I like to also talk briefly about <clears throat> what our purpose is, right? We have three purposes in Alcoholics Anonymous. On page 77, it says our real purpose is to fit ourselves. That means adapt ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. We are here to play the role God has assigned. Then our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And then our big book is to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of our book. So you see, Bill was very, he had certain words that he liked to use over and over and over. And you have to ask yourself, are you fulfilling your purpose? I can answer that question at 17 years sober. Uh Uh-uh, wasn't doing it. I had become so complacent, so in untreated alcoholism. The the, the devilments are on page 52, having trouble with our personal relationships, couldn't control our emotional nature, prey to misery and depression. Oh, you know, when when I hear alcoholic, you know, I'm low maintenance. Oh, whoa, doozy. You might be asleep. Be very careful. At least the alcoholic of my variety. And then here's the other tricky thing. I am clearly... uh, outspoken individual, right? I'm the kind of girl who takes a step forward when I get scared. I'm strong-willed, you know, if that's a term we use, alpha female, whatever you want to call it. And and if you're the guy, that's the same thing, right? That's, there's not much difference. But if you're the personality that is stealth in a room, you're absolutely the ego turned inward. You wouldn't know the difference if you came into a party and left. And people are like, did you meet Mary? I don't even know who Mary was, right? Now, let me make this very clear. That doesn't make you any less alcoholic than I am. It's just the different ways that self shows up for you. You see, you're an extreme example of self will run riot, and you don't think so, and so am I. That's why the beauty of three, four, five, and six is to get Katie to understand exactly how she shows up in her family. How does she show up at AA? How does she show up at work? All these many different characters that I bring to the play. And that's why it is so, so important to really get down to understanding the depth of what the 10 step is asking us. The directions are four through nine, right? The 10 step is basically four through nine. So the 10 step itself has specific directions. But if you need to write inventory, say a problem's really bothering you, then you need to be looking at at four and five because that's where the deep uh, directions are. So the 10th step on the wall says to continue to take personal inventory and when we're wrong, promptly admit it. Well, if you take that step off the wall, which is what I did for a long, long time, you take it off the wall, it looks like damage control. So that I'm really only supposed to do the 10th step when I have upset somebody. And I did that for a long, long time. I think a lot of people do it for a long time until you evolve spiritually into watching your thinking. So this is kind of what it looks like. I'm going through life completely asleep, right? I'm dreaming I'm awake. I'm completely asleep. I step on your toes. You retaliate. You startle me awake. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God, John is pissed off at me. I really upset him. I need to go do a 10th step. So I need to go make my amends to John for stepping on his toes in the meeting, right? And then I fall back asleep and I go through life dreaming I'm awake. See, that is what most people think the 10th step is. But if you get into the depths of the 10th step, it's going to really try to get you to the next level. Spiritual growth is just a slow process. And, and I always like to say, I'm going to get angry or afraid. I don't have the freedom to stay angry and afraid, even if it's called that justifiable resentment. A justifiable resentment is forgiveness. Very difficult for me to do. The book implies so many times that we're going to have problems, right? Uh, I, I like to say they're warnings. You can call them promises. But on page 25, it says to blot out our intolerable situation the best we can or accept spiritual help. On page 53, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we couldn't postpone or evade. God's going to be either everything or nothing. And then page 133, the deliberate manufacturer of misery. God didn't do it. But when trouble comes, cheerfully capitalize on it so he can show his omnipotence. So see, here is the terrible situation or God's help, right? Lack of power is our dilemma. 
Why do they call it the dilemma? Because they both suck. If all of a sudden you need 200 bucks by tomorrow, the thought that you would go to prayer first is pretty, uh, pretty not, not very possible, right? Now, the more spiritually fit you are, oh yeah, you will go to prayer first. And then you will sit back and really listen for God. But that requires a tremendous amount of discipline. Most of us will go figure out how to get 200 bucks before tomorrow. That's what we do. We go into self-reliance. So we're going to blot out our intolerable situation, not accept God's help. Go out there and figure out how to get this. See, it says the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. The word theory we use in 1935 dictionary means speculation, right? It's kind of like, yeah, I'll tell you what to do. I'm not doing it anyway. All of us go through that process, right? Sometimes you'll say it to your sponsee and you're not doing it yourself. And Mark used to say, use the ego for the good, right? All of a sudden you hear yourself telling the sponsee to do something you're not doing. Yeah, you'll go do it. Uh, and then it says, we've entered the world of the spirit. Oh my gosh. I remember the first time I ever read that. I thought, I got no idea what that means. And I was probably around 18 years sober. Mark used to say something. How do you know what you don't know? I love that line because that's a lot of us in AA. This is a this spiritual growth is such a two step forward, one step back kind of a process. And so I'll try to explain to the best of my ability what I think having entered the world of the spirit means. Uh, it's not knowledge; it's clearly experience. So if we are going to do these disciplines of 10 and 11, where I'm getting ready to get into the deep directions of what we are supposed to do every day, not three times a week, not five times a week, not take the weekends off, you're supposed to do these disciplines every day. I know, I know it's a hard pill to swallow. But one of the things that happens is when we start living along this spiritual line, this spiritual principle, this spiritual way of life, all of a sudden, gossip doesn't feel good anymore. Lying doesn't feel good anymore. I am slowly entering the world of the spirit. Now, I always believed in God. I never was one of those alcoholics that had a problem with that. But I was looking for knowledge. I was not looking for an intimate personal relationship with the creator. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know that's what we were supposed to be looking for. I thought we were kind of to figure out the God of my understanding and go, yeah, that's, that's, that's it right over there. That's where I do all my, my God stuff. And come to find out deep down inside every man, woman, and child is that fundamental feeling, understanding, sunlight, the spirit, call it whatever you want. That's what we're looking for. You could call it good conscience, bad conscience, but you're listening for the still quiet voice of the creator. And I'm here to tell you, it's audibly there. It is trust the process. It takes a lot of work to get to this discipline because wait till you hear what it's telling us to do and what the promises are going to promise you get. It's okay to say you're not experiencing those promises. That's a starting point. You know, you're not going to get there because you did this for a month. You're just not. It is something we must do for the rest of our lives. And how do you get there from pain? Pain is the touchstone of growth. So here's the directions about what our next function is. Our next function, which means expected duty, this coffee cup's expected duty is to hold my liquid. So our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. That prayer alone, if really meant purposefully, will bring you an amazing experience. When I first got on fire with AA, I came out of the gate. Oh, you can imagine how I was. I was hard on my sponsees. I'm like, oh my God, there's a message of depth and weight. I had no idea. I'm correcting people in meetings. Oh, that, yep, that's the, that's the person I was. And I was pissed. I was pissed a lot of times because don't these people understand what they're not doing? It's a room full of open, they're not even talking about alcoholism in that room. Now that room used to feed me like crazy. When they would say, anybody got a topic? I'm like, teenage boys. Yeah, that was me. And uh, I had no idea. How do you know what you don't know? I loved Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't realize I was in there not talking about alcoholism. And uh, so come to find out, one of the things that I love about this is I called my buddy Bob. and I said, Bob, I'm pissed off all the time. And he said, Katie, say the prayer of growing understanding and effectiveness. That was all he said to me. And that night I prayed that prayer and I'm here to tell you guys, it's the only defect of character that God has given me a sense of grace over that's 
remarkable. I mean, I am not that person anymore. I am much kinder. I am loving. I am understanding. I'm talking more about myself. I come at you with so much understanding and effectiveness, and it's not lost on me. I asked this prayer uh, 15 years ago, and I really believe that God said, Katie, I'm going to have you so far on those firing lines. If you don't get this under control, you're going to damage more people than you're going to help. I really believe that. If he was in a huddle with all the angels, I think they're going, somebody's got to slow her down because, wow, she's a lot coming at you. And I, I don't, I feel a sense of different approach every time. And don't get me wrong. Somebody says something. I'm like, oh my God, he did not just say that again. And, but I don't come at you that way. It says to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. This is the first beginning of what the 10th step is saying to watch for, not watch for it in our actions. We are to watch for it in our thinking. So if we are to continue to watch for selfishness, that's wanting everybody to do as I wish. It all goes back to the third step. I'm the actor running the whole show, forever trying to raise the lights, the scenery, the ballet. If everyone would do as Katie wished, the show would be great. Everyone, including Katie, would be happy. That, how bad can that be? Well, here's the only problem. The play never suits me. When you do as I wish, I still don't want it that way. You still didn't do it right. I am never satisfied. My sweet friend, Chris Schroeder, I love it. He says, we wake up in the morning, restless, irritable, and discontented. We either go up to happy, joyous, and free, or down to the four horsemen, and that's going through the bedevilments. Because the nature of the alcoholic is discontent. I mean, just ask yourself, can you get behind the wheel of a car and not complain about driving? Can you stand at the grocery store? Can you sit in the, an AA meeting and not think, what an idiot. It is just of our nature. We're not bad people. We're just restless, irritable, and discontented. The sooner you wrap your brain around that, the weller you will get with it all. Because once you watch for it, you begin to go into the 10th step. God, you must redirect this. The dishonesty is in three forms, right? Flat out lying. We're always so proud that we flat out don't lie. And you do. Oh, everybody still lies. A lot of people go, I, I don't lie. Yeah, well, you just lied by telling me you don't lie. You know, it may be a white lie. You know, did you run by the grocery store, honey? Sure did. Well, I'm getting ready to pull in the grocery store now because I almost forgot. You see what I mean? I mean, we're not blatant liars like we used to be. I mean, some people could be. I, I certainly can be. But lying, not telling the whole truth, or believing the delusional lie, there's three forms of dishonesty. And the delusion, I don't even know it's a delusion. And I'm believing it. That's what's so tricky. It's not denial. And then resentment and fear. And, and it's interesting because people go, oh, my God, Katie. It says, when these crop up, right? This is in my thinking, not in my actions. We are to ask God at once to remove it. We are to discuss them with somebody immediately. We are to make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. And then we're resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Now, listen to the urgency of this 10th step, this spot check inventory. We're to ask God at once, talk to somebody immediately, quickly make amends, and then resolutely turn our thoughts, not our actions to somebody. This is pretty urgent. This is not end of the night review. Remember, that's the 11th step. So when we break these things down, we're talking about watching our thinking. So we're watching the thinking. And when these crop up, we are to attack them on that, on that plane. Emmett Fox is, I think, one of the greatest teachers ever uh, about talking about our thought life and redirecting, redirecting. So how do I break this 10th step down? Okay, the minute I am watching my thinking, and what you have to do is start it in increments of 30 minutes. That's it. So when you finish this meeting, write a little note to yourself that says, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to watch my thinking just for 30 minutes. And you're going to be surprised. Don't do anything about it. Just watch it. And it is a, it's a nut job up there. I mean, our first thought is typically quite ugly, but I'm not, you can't hold me accountable for my first thought. I am responsible for every thought after that. But my very first thought can be quite ugly, especially if you scare me. My first thought is, oh, I, I would take you down. What do they think? Of, who do they think they are? Right. I mean, that's the nature of it. So when we ask God to remove it, 
You, you, if you remove a thought, you must replace a thought. So you have to understand spiritual laws. It doesn't matter if you have whatever spiritual religion you choose to do. And I'm using religion lightly, whatever spiritual path you choose to go down. If that just bothers you, write a little piece of inventory on that. If that bothers you, there's something in that that's bugging you. And so when we look at this, all spiritual teachers all have spiritual law. As a man thinketh, we reap what we sow, self-fulfilling prophecy, water seeks its own level, so within as without, right? These are all in all spiritual programs. So what we have to do, and I, like I said, I lean towards Christianity, and these are out of Emmett Fox. So the two laws that come into play when we ask God at once to remove it are the law of substitution and the law of subconscious activity. So here's the law of substitution. There are a few great laws that govern all things, just as there are a few fundamental laws in chemistry. We know that thought control is the key of destiny. And in order to learn thought control, we have to know and understand these laws. Very, very important. Don't dismiss them. You don't, you don't argue with the law of gravity and go jump off a building, go, oh, I hope it's suspended right now. You don't stick a, a fork in a plug. Law of electricity, you may not understand how it works, but you're not. You're going to respect them. This is the same with these laws says one of the great mental laws is the law of substitution. This means that the only way to get rid of a certain thought is to substitute another one for it. You cannot dismiss a thought directly. Interesting. You can only do so by substituting another one for it. When a negative thought comes to you, don't fight them, but think of something positive. Preferably think of God. But if that's too difficult at the moment, turn your attention to something quite different. So you're affirming something. So say you and your boss are having a beef, right? And you, you just don't get along at all. As a matter of fact, you two don't even like each other. Affirm this relationship is built on integrity and, and respect and that your boss and you get along great. Just a three to 10 second redirect is all we're looking for. And people go, well, that's not even true. I don't care. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to feel it. You just have to do it. And, and don't dismiss it till you've tried it. Mark used to say something else. I, you know, I'm not interested in, on an on a, uh, experience that you haven't had. So I'm not interested in your opinion. Once you've had an experience with it, then let's talk about it. So if all you're giving me is your opinion of what you think about it, go have the experience and then we can talk. Now, here's the law of subconscious activity. This one's a dandy. It says, as soon as the subconscious mind accepts any idea, it immediately begins trying to put it into effect. It uses all its resources, and these are far greater than is commonly supposed. It uses every bit of knowledge that you have ever collected. Wow. And most of which you've totally forgotten to bring about its purpose. It mobilizes many mental, mental, many mental powers that you possess, most of which you never consciously use. It draws on the unlimited energy of the racing mind. It lines up all the laws of nature as they operate both inside and outside of you to get its way. Sometimes it succeeds in its purpose immediately. Sometimes it takes a little time. Sometimes it takes a long time. But if this is not utterly impossible, the subconscious will bring it about once it accepts the idea. That ought to make your butt pucker. I'm telling you what, that racing mind, you see something and you think, how did Mary know about that? Well, Mary knew about that because I bet Bucko. Oh, I knew Bucko. Oh, my God. That's what happened. That's how fast the racing mind of the alcoholic must figure something out because we are driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, seeming without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we made a decision based on self that later placed us in this position to be hurt. This is the subconscious mind doing that. So here's the beauty. This law is true, both good and bad. Thank God. This law, when used negatively, brings sickness, trouble, and failure. And when used positively, brings healing, freedom, and success. We give the orders, the subconscious does the work. You see, if you believe that you will never have a good job, you will never have a good job. See, you believe it. You will manifest trouble. And, and, and I'm not into the secret and all of that stuff. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm talking spiritual laws. They are true. They are factual. And if you don't believe it, please try it. So in your 30 minutes after the meeting, and you're watching, you're thinking, you can just observe it tonight. If on awakening, you want to get into watch, turn, watch, turn, 
watch that thinking and you're scared to death that you're not going to keep your job. All of a sudden you go, oh my God, I got the best job in the whole wide world. It is so secure. We're not identifying that you've kept that job, but whatever job you have, it is secure. A three to 10 second redirect. That's what the 10th step is talking about. And on some days, you may have to redirect 80 times because you're watching your thinking and when it crops up. I always thought it was one and done. I thought I just had to pray for it. And then you know, I've already prayed for that. Why does it keep popping back up? Because the ego is insistent on making this happen. Then it says we have to talk to somebody immediately. Now, I like to give this example because Marty, uh, my sponsor and I, we are huge 10 step people. I call them 10 step buddies. You should have at least three or four people who are willing to be able to tell you exactly how they see you've made decisions based on self and, and hand it to you. You can't get somebody who's going to co-sign you. So <clears throat> make this story kind of quick because getting 10 and 11 in this uh, fast is a lot of work. Uh, I had my husband uh, that passed away, went back out after 23 years sober, died of a heroin overdose, devastating uh, time in my life. Uh, you know, we were married 20 years. I didn't even know relapse was an option. I know, shake your head, but then ask yourself, are you working an AA program like the big book says? Because it's, it's possible for everybody. And yet we aren't necessarily doing it. And so Joe had had a brain tumor. He was a very sick man. He had hep C. He'd had two back surgeries. And he was the kind of guy that we worked it out. We were raising kids. We got together young. We started off that I ran the show as far as the household. So when we went into the doctor's office, I had the notepad. I was answering the questions. Joe had had a brain injury, so he, he wasn't really sharp. And that's just how we did it. And he was fine with it. I loved it, right? He loved it. Well, I married Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker operates in a different parameter in the doctor's office. OK, he doesn't always tell him the truth and he does kind of like to be shucking and jiving. And I'm kind of just supposed to sit there. I'm not really supposed to say, well, now, Charlie, that wasn't that wasn't exactly how that went down. And I'm not supposed to say anything. OK, I don't do that very well, but that's my role. Well, Charlie has a scare with throat surgery, as most of you guys know, he's having, you know, it, it's not it's not. Uh, excuse me, with throat cancer. It's not cancer. He's one dysplasia away. We find this out about 10 years ago, but we have to go back to this throat doctor um, about three times a year. He's in San Antonio, about 70 miles away. He's got to run a scope down Charlie's throat. And about every two to three years, he does a little bit of throat surgery because throat surgery, uh, throat cancer grows slowly. So we can keep an eye on it. Well, so we do this a lot, right? And this particular day, I think I'm pretty spiritually fit. We've been doing it now for 10 years. Okay, I think I'm pretty spiritually fit several years ago. We're going in there. We get up early. We like to have uh, breakfast at our favorite restaurant. Charlie and I spend a lot of time together. That may not be your cup of tea in your marriage. We like it. And uh, so, and then we go to the outlet mall and we go shopping and we, we, we make a day of this event. The doctor loves us. We love the doc. There's the story. Okay, so I'm in there. And this particular day, we have to wake up very early to get down there. I'm not really that much of a morning person. And uh, we get in the doctor's office and uh, the, she says, you, you know, you use using much nose spray. And, you know, Charlie's shucking and jiving. How are the boys? And, you know, and it's, we only got like 15 minutes. Let's get to business. And she says, you using much nose spray? And he goes, ah. well, he uses it about every 15 minutes. Afrin. It's around the house like cheater glasses. It's everywhere. We don't go anywhere without Afrin. And then she says, are you clearing your throat much in the morning? Goes, no, 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 no. All morning, you can hardly get a straight sentence out of him because that's all he's doing is clearing his throat. And I am sitting there and I am getting madder and madder. Now, this is not the first time. This is about the 30th time, okay? I've been in there. And I'm getting madder and madder. And I look at him when she walks out. I said, Charlie Parker, you are a big, fat liar. Just like that. Yeah, quote, unquote. He comes out of the chair like the Incredible Hulk. You know, he goes, get out! And I mean, I thought, that's it. And I do that uncontrollable crying. You women know what it is. It's when you are pissed and you can't stop crying. And I grab my stuff and I'm out of there. I am out of there. And right when I go walking out, the doc comes walking in. And he goes, whoa, Katie, are you okay? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. And I go out. Why? Because the Parkers have rolled in. Right. The people in AA that don't think they're extreme examples of self will run riot. Well, here it is. And I go out into the uh, lobby and I mean, I've got a piece. I've got a magazine and I can't stop crying. 
And I mean, I'm holding it like this. <laughs> and I think, oh my God, I've got to talk to Marty. Well, my, my sponsor has a very high end job in the criminal court system and she's always in court. And I, you know, she can't very well take my call and go, eh, excuse me, judge, uh, Katie's calling, you know, and I even asked the judge and the judge said, we're not taking your call. Katie. So, okay, okay, just check it. So I have to text. I'm not a fan of texting 10 steps. Please hear me out. I had one guy take issue with that, whatever. You know, text her for facts, not feelings. But I know that if Marty is in court, she can't take this message. She knows I'm down there because she knows the drill of this thing. So here's the text I sent her. I also have told my sponsor we have a doctor's appointment. So she's on top of it. She's not just getting a call from Katie. She's on high alert. Batman, you know, the bats in the sky, Gotham City's on fire. Says, <clears throat> Marty, this is me talking to her. I need a new toolkit for a sick husband. We're at the doctor's office and I just left the room. I can't stop crying. I must sit there and be submissive. I can't do that. He doesn't give them enough information. Now, if you listen to enough 10 steps, you just heard the old idea that's driving me is I must sit there and be submissive. You see, I'm scared to death that somebody's going to make me a submissive woman. I know you're sitting there thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Katie will never be submissive. I don't care. When I get scared and I think you're trying to silence me, I'll kill both of us. You know, this, this is not new information. I left home at 15 because my dad would not stop jumping my butt because I was such a liar. Uh-huh. So then Marty texts me right back. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. It must be so painful because she always just strokes you and then she knocks you out just like that little baby seal, just whack right in the head. Says, I'm sure he's scared, maybe even terrified. None of this is about you. How can you be helpful? Are you in that doctor's office treating him like he knows nothing? Are you the doctor police? How are you coming off when giving information to the doctors? Are you smugly superior? Yeah, yeah, she's a fast texter too, let me tell you. And I swear to God, the part that shocked me the most, I texted her back going, yes, instantly stopped crying. The truth will set you free. That's exactly what she did. Oh, and she's not done yet. Stepping on his toes, are you? Well, if not you, who? All cloaked in a good motive. You have all the tools, hon. Just use them. I know hospitals and doctors are traumatic stuff for you and you go on super high alert. This is a new day. And I texted her back, thanks. Now, this all happened within about four minutes of me walking out and this conversation because it says talk to somebody immediately. Most of us can talk to somebody immediately with cell phones. Don't tell me you can't, okay? Most of us can. I get it. There's a situation from time to time, but most of us can. So the best part of this story is Charlie comes out of that appointment. He's not finished with his appointment. It's been five minutes. He walks out. He hasn't had his throat scoped or anything. And he says, Katie, please come back in. Had I not done this, I couldn't have moved. My pride won't let me move. I am, I am stuck. I will cut off my nose to spite my face. And I gave him a hug. And he said, you know, honey, I'm sorry. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, too. We're, we're both just wound so tight. You see, guys, don't underestimate urgency. And the other cool thing that came about this is when we drove to the outlet mall on the way home, God put on my heart that I do this to almost all the men in my life. I'm scared to death for their well-being. I take very good care of the temple. I always have. As a matter of fact, if I go out, let me tell you something. The temple is looking good. The temple is healthy as can be. Sure, something could happen to me. But the truth of the matter is, is I like the temple that God gave me. But not everybody views it that way. That's totally fine. My son doesn't take care of his temple. My husband darn sure didn't take care of his temple. My husband that passed away. And, and, it, and it upsets me. So I called my son and I had the coolest conversation with him. And I said, Sam, I realized I really stay on your ass about your health. And I'm sorry. I'm going to really try to quit doing that. And he goes, oh, mom. He goes, I actually like it. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? And I said, so it, you, it's okay if I stay on your butt about your teeth and that you don't drink enough water. You need to quit smoking and all that stuff. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Well, so he gave me the freedom to do that. Now, I've, I've backed it down a little bit, okay? But this is so important. The other thing that Charlie and I do is do-overs. Oh my God, remember when you were a kid and you just do a do-over with your brother and sister and it was all forgotten? Oh my God, do-overs are wonderful. Say you both have a big beef 
And, and all of a sudden, I don't even need to tell Marty. I already clearly saw where I made decisions based on self. I should not have told Charlie that it was a lot like his family, and that's what his family does. And, blah, 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 blah. and so I'll come back in and go, Charlie, can we have a do-over? And he goes, yeah, this is when we're neither one going to agree. And then all of a sudden, we have to reenact it and say kind things instead of say the ugly stuff. It's really cool. It works great. It says love and tolerance of others is our code, right? What does that mean? It's a body of laws. See, I was working an AA program like chicken soup for the soul. I did not realize this. And so when we're, at, when we're saying to make amends quickly and resolutely turn our thoughts to others, I do all that in the affirmative prayer, right? Now, if I need to go out and make the amends, I'll certainly do it. But it's, it's, it's asking us, it's saying, if you've stepped on their toes, we're hoping you have it. We're hoping you did the first two things and didn't step on somebody's toes. Mark used to say, wait, watch, turn, watch, turn, wait. Don't go out there and take the, the uh, bull by the horns. It also talks about this. When, when I was working a program like Chicken Soup for the Soul, you know, the great little slogans and the little sayings, don't get me wrong, they're nice. They won't touch you when you're losing your mind, but they are nice. There's some really cool stuff. But I think what the book is trying to tell me is if a, if a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago, but we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us. No matter how much we tried, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could wish these things with all our might. The needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Lack of power was our dilemma. Let me tell you something. If I know that hospitals scare me, I darn sure better work way far on the front end. I'm not going to be walking in the hospital and say the prayer. I have worked way far on the front end in the evening review, watching, turning, watching, turning, talk with Marty, gotten this all prepared. This is not just a quick little, you know, Hail Mary prayer. And then it says, and we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. So if you've ceased fighting anything or anyone, that's money, weather, traffic, everything. Well, I thought this position of neutrality that the book is talking about, we face as though we, we feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I thought that meant like Switzerland. I wish there was a little saying that said, you may not feel so good. OK, just because you're in a position of neutrality, it doesn't always feel good. I know better than to say something. I know that. You know why? I've said it 800 times. I've had my ass handed to me so many times that the pain is too much for me. So I start to do this based on the pain. I wish I could only have done it 80 times and learn, but that's just not been my experience. And I sponsor half the country. It's not their experience either. So I'm assuming it's probably not the majority of alcoholics experience. You see, this position of neutrality does not always feel good. Every once in a while, I can, I can really, uh, uh, what's the line that says, um, uh, oh, it's just not coming to me. Uh, but sometimes I can actually feel at ease in the position of neutrality, but it's not more than not, it's an uncomfortable feeling. This self-centered fear is I'm scared to death. I'm not going to get something. And then when I get it now, I'm scared to death. I'm going to lose it. So you see, there's always a level of discontent in a lot of things. All of a sudden, something great happens and you're going, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it's like, well, there, there it is. You're going to lose it now that you got it. I mean, it's just the nature of our thinking. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It's just something you have to watch for. And it says, this is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Well, Mark was the one who said to me, he goes, Katie, fit spiritual condition is, you know, you've been an athlete all your life. Mark was a jock. I'm an athlete. I was in the fitness business for 30 years. I don't always feel like going to the gym, but I do it. I sit in front of the gym for 30 minutes. I don't want to go in, but I do it. He said, take that same discipline into 10 and 11. Holy smokes. It changed everything. Everything. That's why I said, you don't do prayer and meditation three out of seven days. You do it seven days. Yeah, I know. It's a lot to take, isn't it? And it says it's easy to let up on this spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. There's the part of the book that says it's easy. Not doing it. And what you do is you grow in AA, you hit walls between 18 months and three years, three and five, five and seven, seven and 12, 12 and 15, 15 and 18, 18 and 22, 22 and 26. It's the nature of spiritual growth. 
you never arrive. I thought we arrived. You don't, you just grow more and more and more. It's like what I know at 63 as opposed to what I knew at 53 is incredible. Let me tell you what, I love getting older. Now the hair, the eyes, the skin, okay, that's, a, that's problematic. But what I got up here, oh my God, I would not trade for anything. I love the life I have. I love the experience I have. If I were to go tomorrow, please celebrate my life. It was unbelievable. So if it's easy to rest on our spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels, that's our past experience. Mark used to say every spiritual awakening has an expiration date on it. And if you rest on the one that you got when you first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what I did, let me tell you what. It says on page 14, for if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he can't handle certain trials and low spots ahead. I don't know if that's a flat tire or losing a job, but let me tell you, that is not the day you find out you can't handle it. And that's what it's talking about. And that's what happened to me. And let me, oh my gosh, I'm telling you, dark, dark night of the soul for about 18 months, some of the darkest days of my life. It says we are headed for trouble if we do. Why? Because alcohol is a subtle foe means crafty. See, on page 61, it says that I am a victim of the delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. See, that's what I lived in. See, you scare me bad enough, I go to self-reliance. You make me angry enough, I go to self-reliance. There you have it. It's just of our nature. So if it's telling me I'm a victim, I'm tricked or duped by my own delusion, listen to the definition of delusion. It's an impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is accepted as reality. <laughs> Typically a symptom of a mental disorder. Yeah, that's me. Outright mental defect, full flight from reality. Can't differentiate the truth from the false. I love that. It, I'm not a bad person. This is just what my illness that I suffer from. And then it says to, to rest, which means to seize by force, satisfaction and happiness, being right and happy. You ever had somebody say, would you rather be right or happy? Well, I want to slap you. I want to, I want to be right. Okay, let's be real clear on that. And if happiness comes with that, well, ain't that just great? But the truth of the matter is, is you want to be right too. It, why would they put it in the book? Oh, okay. And what we really have is a daily reprieve. That means to grant temporary delay contingent, which means occurring if certain things are met on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. This is very important. Every day is the day we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. I'm telling you what, if you're not spiritually fit, you can't do that. And you know how I know that? Because I wasn't spiritually fit. It, what I have today, based on these disciplines that I have been doing like nobody's business for six years consistently, is that God stops every moment of my life. When I'm at the gas pump, I'm looking around. God, is there somebody here I need to smile at? I need to see. When I'm in the car, who should I call next, God? Tell me what I need to do. See, I don't have to make myself think about God. It is there because it's the gift that is granted when you do these disciplines. You eat well and exercise every day. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be in good shape. I know it. Shocking. And it, because it's the nature of it, you drive the speed limit, you're probably not going to get a ticket. It's the nature of it. And it says every day is the day we must carry this vision into all our activities, traffic, lines, AA members, ex-husbands, ex-in-laws. If we have carefully followed direction, remember on page 29, clear-cut directions are given showing exactly how we have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. We have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we've become God conscious. Our thought life will be placed on a higher plane. This is terminology I've never used before. We've begun to develop this vital sixth sense. I'm telling you guys, I live it. I didn't even know it was possible, but I began trusting Mark's process and I wanted it. And if you want something bad enough, you will start to do the disciplines that are required right? Get up 30 minutes early. Sorry. If you got kids, get up 30 minutes early. You know what? That's going to require you going to bed an hour early. Sorry. These are the things you must do. And, and this is thought life, God conscious, thought life, God conscious. I was living a life of thought react. I had a thought. I reacted. You said something. I didn't like it. I said something. I walk into the middle of two people talking. What are y'all talking about? Bring me up to snuff. 
See, I never even considered how inconsiderate I was. And and people like me. I have a likable personality. So they just kind of take you for face value, right? Oh, it's Katie. We love her. You know, that's how she is. See, I, I missed all this. I missed all this. As a matter of fact, I like to tell people, when you're with a bunch of people talking, not alcoholics, just at work, watch how many people, when you say something, they go like this. Yeah, if you don't think you live in a thought react world, watch how people react to what you have to say, right? It's this still quiet voice. God spoke to us drunk. He spoke to us sober, but it says we must go for, for we must go further. And that means more action. That is the 11th step, guys. That was the 10th step. Interesting perspective, right? Study the heck out of it. Don't read through it. It's four paragraphs. Study a paragraph a week. Uh, read the paragraph, go back through it every morning, ask yourself, what does that mean to you? When you feel like you finally have moved to the next one. If you're reading four pages in the morning, 84 through 86, it's redundant. You've missed a ton. You're just got checking off the list. This has got to be different than that. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on the matter of prayer. Better than better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. Well, that's interesting. The attitude. What attitude is that? The attitude is on page 55. I always thought the book meant, ah, I got a good attitude. I'm a positive person. I've always been optimistic. Yeah, I got a good attitude. Let's go for it. No. The attitude on page 55 says we can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, it's what we agnostics is all about. It's constantly telling us about our prejudice, our prejudgment. We judge everything. The sooner you understand you're a hypocrite, the freer you're going to be. It's just of our nature. I cannot say that enough. People want to act like that's not who they are. That's not how they are. It is. Okay. I, unless half the country that I sponsor happens to be the only ones in Alcoholics Anonymous that are an extreme example of self-will or unriot, though they don't think so. Okay. There you have it. So if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enable you to think honestly, enable you to think honestly. Is it possible that maybe you don't think honestly? You can't differentiate the true from the false. Your alcoholic life is the only normal one. See, I, I can't differentiate sometimes the true from the false. I believe that's reality. If you told me that's not true, I don't believe you. You're lying. There, there's an example of it right there. Encourage you to search diligently within yourself. It takes courage to do this stuff. None of us like the leveling of our pride, right? the admitting of our shortcomings. This is in, this is a, there is a solution. This is what is required. We must continue to take this inventory. And, and my buddy, Blind Dave says this so beautifully. He says that evening review, it's all like 10 and 11 are like a fountain. The top tier of the fountain is the evening review. The, the uh, second tier is the 10th step, right? Our, our watching for, watching for. And the, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the top tier is the um, uh, evening review. The next tier is the morning prayer and meditation. And the bottom one is our life, the 10th step, watching for it. He says, if you want to shut everything down, stick your finger in the top hole that's going into the evening review, and that will stop everything. See, I think so many people put so much energy in on awakening and they, they read great spiritual literature. They feel really good. It does feel good to read great spiritual literature. But if you're not taking your corrective measures from the day before into on awakening, asking the, to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives, then you're missing the point. You're to look at your 24 hours ahead. Why would that be important? Because I'm taking all my BS from the day before into the next day. It doesn't just go away. I'm having a beef with somebody at work. I'm having a beef with a sponsee. I don't like my neighbor. Whatever the case may be, this is so important to get this down to the specifics, right? The steps tell us when to take them, how to take them, and why to take them. So this, this evening review is so crucial. So I have this evening review. This is my, my notepad. That's all evening review. And let me tell you, if you got somebody in the house that might be reading any of your inventory, do not leave it sitting around. You should take it with you, get rid of it, throw it away, burn it, whatever. But don't leave some of your stuff sitting around and then be pissed off at somebody for reading your literature. You left it there. This is personal stuff. I tell people all the time, if something's to happen to me and I get taken out, 
Somebody go in there and get my God dang evening review. I don't want anybody reading that thing. And Charlie does not touch it. We, we have that pretty understood. But that's really, really important. So evening review is a special pad. Then I have my to-do list. That's another pad. And then I have my love letters to God or my two-way prayer. Some of you guys have been following uh, Father Bill. So I have three pads I work out of in the morning because this is very important. This morning time, if you want to sit in quiet meditation, rock on, go for it. But it's not the practice the book is talking about. You get to do whatever you want in your morning time as long as you follow the clear-cut directions. So when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. The word constructive means to overhaul it, to really look at it thoroughly. There are seven questions we are to ask ourselves. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? I don't want to answer yes or no. I want to answer where was I? Of course I was resentful. You get through a day and not be resentful, whatever, right? Selfish, of course I was. I may not have shown outward selfishness, but I had inward thoughts of it. Dishonesty, definitely afraid. These are trying times we are in. We are all wrapped very, very tight. Do I owe an apology? Hmm, interesting question. Did I not basically do a 10th step? Here's the next line that's going to step. You're going to step in the hole of not doing a 10th step. Have I kept something to myself which should have been discussed with another person at once? It's basically saying, did you do a 10th step? And if you didn't do a 10th step, you probably owed an amends that you didn't take care of. Uh, were we kind and loving towards all? I can tell you, I can answer yes to that question a lot of times. Uh, what could we have done better? There's some things I could have made a couple more phone calls. I could have been a little, uh, not, not quite so short with somebody. Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? You know what? You really do this program deeply and, and you're not really thinking of yourself most of the time. Now, don't get me wrong. These are trying times right now. But when life is going along as life normally does, that answer can certainly be no, I'm thinking of others. My, my morning time is all about others. I, I, I bring a lot of my sponsees' problems, everybody's problems, into my on awakening. And, and if you've come to me and talked to me about a problem, I can promise you I've taken it into prayer and meditation. Because it's asking me, were we kind and loving towards all? What could we have done better? Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking what we could do for others? Or what we could pack into the stream of life? Why would they ask the question if I'm going to ignore it in my lifetime? Mm -hmm. Just saying. Uh, and then it says warning, but we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Why? Because it's going to make us feel bad? No, because it would diminish my usefulness to others. Shut up. Really? I mean, if we're not worrying about our kids or remorseful for something I said, you know what I mean? I mean, it is so easy to go into any of those things. We must recoil from those as if they are a hot flame. Let me tell you. It says, after making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. That means able to correct. That's why I take those corrective measures into on awakening. I wait a little while. I go into some prayers. I'm thinking of others. I've answered the questions. I'm reviewing the day. And God sets on my heart everything. I list the people I talk to. I look at my phone. I list all the people I talk to. Some of this stuff is good. It's not all in red, right? There is some in red, but I go through all the people I talk to. I look at my text. I look at my, my to-do list of the day. I am constructively reviewing my day. I'm not going just on memory. Trust me. It, it will forget a lot of stuff. And then it takes on to on awakening. Let us think about our 24 hours ahead. Here's my to-do pad. We consider our plans for the day. I used to hear people say, you're supposed to just listen. Well, of course, I wasn't reading the big book, so I can't blame anybody, right? Blaming others is as far as most of us ever, ever got anyway. We must disregard the other man entirely. The inventory is mine. I must look at me, period. So if I am to consider my plan for the day, I'll write down what I'd like to see done. Then I'm going to take that pad with me. And when I go throughout the day and I face indecision, right? Or excuse me, when I go throughout the day and I pause when agitated or doubtful, I go, you know what, God, I don't know if I should run by Target or uh, run to the bank right now. Because if you ask me, I'll do it all. But I'll drive 100 miles an hour and everybody will piss me off in traffic. And God's like, just give you two seconds. And he goes, go to the bank first. Okay, there must be somebody at the bank I'm supposed to smile at, see, whatever the case may be. But I intuitively know how to handle those situations. God puts it on my heart. I'm no longer stressed. Matter of fact, I may not be able to get to 
get to Target today. That may not be on God's plan. May have to wait till tomorrow. See, I used to run a to-do list. And boy, I got to get everything on that to-do list. So it says, <clears throat> before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. Hmm. Especially ask it to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motive. Isn't that an interesting choice of words? Divorce. It doesn't say divorce from fear. It says self-pity. When you wake up tomorrow, I want you to consider your very first thought. It's usually, what time is it? Oh, especially with the stupid time change. What time is it? Oh, God. Let me, let me have 15 more minutes. Yeah, there's self-pity right there. It says, under these conditions, which means state of mind, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. But that's under these conditions. What conditions are those that we're doing? 10, an evening review into on awakening. This is not just because I just decided to wake up today and go, going to read me some spiritual literature, get a little chicken soup for the soul AA and go out there and take on the world. It just isn't. And, and I missed it forever. It says our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Boy, is that true. It's incredible. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We're still in prayer and meditation. Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or decision. There's still no action taken. We relax and take it easy. You don't sit in prayer and meditation and stay focused hard on something. The right answer will come if our own house is in order. It darn sure works. Trust this process. What used to be a hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Huh. Isn't that fantastic? What a promise. Is that your experience? If it's not, trust me, it can be. Being, and this, I love this line, being still in experience and having just made conscious contact with God, that's every one of us every day because we are in experience and we are just making conscious contact with God that morning. Mark used to say, I die at night and I'm awakened in the morning. And I think, oh, this guy is so over the top. I get it today. I so get it. I go to bed and then I wake up the next morning and this is all new. It says, uh, and having just made conscious contact with God, it's not probable that we're going to be inspired at all times. Of course not. The book promises me that I'm going to have some very flat periods. We might pay for this presumption and all sorts of absurd thoughts and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We really do become to rely upon this. And then I love this. This is if this pause went agitated or doubtful. We call it pars. It's a spiritual gift. Pause, ask, remind, and say. It says, as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. Now it's talking about an action. See, I'm much more doubtful than I am agitated. I'm not quite sure, God, what you want me to do here. Please talk to me. And I get a two-second pause. Like all of a sudden, I want to say something to somebody. And remember, I told you I lived in that thought react. And all of a sudden, God goes, no, nah, you're not spiritually fit enough to get into that conversation. Okay. Or this is not your business, Katie. Don't do that. And God is just talking to me the whole time. It's, it's an incredible gift. The first few times I heard, I was thinking, whoa, what is happening? I wanted more. We constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show, humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, thy will not mine be done. Now, I don't care how you word all this. Pause, ask, remind, and say, right? Pause when agitated or doubtful. Ask for the right thought or action. Remind him I'm not running the show. God, tell me what you want me to do. I don't care how you say it. You just got to do it. It says we're then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. <laughs> what? So you're telling me I have some level of control over living a life like that? Yeah. See, that's self-reliance right there. That's where I lived all the time. And I actually liked it. I had to wait till it, I didn't like it, till it became uncomfortable. Then I wanted to make some change. We become much more effective. We do not tire so easily for we're no longer burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. It works. It really does. You see, page 62, the third step is where this all really begins. This third step is, it says it didn't work, right? That playing God didn't work. And here at the 11th step, it says it worked. But there is all those steps in between. All this action must be taken. 
if you haven't written a piece of inventory in months, that's too long. I'm sorry, it is. I, I stand firm in that. I, I, people, I don't think people understand. They think when they write inventory, it's got to be that big fourth and fifth step they originally wrote. I didn't write a piece of inventory for 15 years. I didn't know you had to. My God, I write about two pieces of inventory a month. I write a fear inventory about once a week, especially in this current environment. That, that fear inventory, when I see it, God speaks to me so beautifully. That third uh, notebook is my love letters to God. I always start my morning with a love letter to God. Father God, today I'm hurting bad. I've got three sponsees that are in real trouble. My husband and I are having difficult times and I'm concerned for my son's marriage. Oh, these, this is good stuff to be talking to God about. I'm laying it all out there. What's going on in my life, man? This is heavy duty stuff. And at the very end of all my prayer and meditation time, I write my love letter back to God. He calls me my child. I call him Father God. And I just let that pen run just like they do in the two-way prayer. It'll move you to tears. It moves me to tears just talking about it. I can't believe this relationship I have with God. It is so remarkable. I worked very hard at understanding how to have a relationship with God. And I trusted the process. And in the end, what I have is I can write a love letter to God wherever I am. Whenever I'm really angry or really scared, I just write a love letter to God. I hear the undeniable voice of God tell me that he will take care of me. Trust this process, guys. 10 and 11, the idea of watching for selfish, dishonesty, resentment, and fear is much different than waiting for it. You are watching for these things. You must do all the work that the book is telling us. Then you must be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. God is trying so hard to slowly rip away this ego that it's just trying to pull you down. Its number one job is to destroy us. The fifth step says we are on a life or death errand. The book is not mincing any words about how important continued inventory is. Don't think that you're not to write inventory again. It takes a few seconds to scribble it out right? Understanding inventory is really, really important. I've got a ton of stuff I can send you guys. If you pin my picture uh, at the bottom is my email. And if I speak the language that talks to you, just send me an email. Please don't send me your life story. I, I, I'm not much of an emailer anyway. I don't like a whole ton of stuff of what's going on in your life. I can't communicate by typing. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot you a thing that says, call me. I can do that much better, but just send me an email that says, send me all your stuff and I can help you on this road of understanding. You see in Bill's story, it said at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time there. I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood it. Why does he say, as I then understood it? Because like I said, spiritual growth comes like maturity. What worked at three years doesn't work at five years. What worked in my life at 20 years doesn't work at 40 years old. Everything must be evolving and changing. It's experience and maturity. These things come. Like I said, being 63 is fabulous. I love what I've learned in maturity. I love what I've learned in the 36 years of sobriety. It says, to do with me as he would, I place myself undeservingly under his care and direction. I have not had a drink since. I was to test my thinking by the new God conscious within. That's that unblock, right? Is to get unblocked. We don't get unblocked and stay unblocked. We must continue this process. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. Uh, my friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a relationship with my creator that I would have the elements of a way of living that would answer all my problems. You bet all your problems, food, money, sex, relationships, everything. I promise that is a true statement. Belief in a power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. I must turn in all things to the father of life who presides over all of us. While I laid in the hospital and thought that thought came to me that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have had what had been so freely given to them. Perhaps I could help some of them. They in turn might work with others. I thank you, God, and I thank you, Bill, for bringing this to me, this life I never believed I could have. And of course, the beauty of that 12th step, 
It's not optional. Sponsor people. Carry the message to the other drunk. Practice these principles in all our affairs. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this with you. I'm here talking to middle management guys. If you've been around AA and you're not feeling it, there is a ton more. I think the new guy is the blood of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a lot of message for the new guy. I don't always think there's a ton of message for the guy with time. So I'm here to tell you, if the new guy is the blood, middle management is the oxygen. And the blood cannot survive without the oxygen. If you're not in the book, please get in the book. And if you are, see you on the fire lines. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.